Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Vishweshwar Gobai Vishi. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of TBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. On behalf of the organizers, I welcome you all to the launch event of the early years, a window of opportunity, a virtual exhibition. Over the next few hours, Professor Monika Lakanpal of UCL, the India Alliance and team hopes to take you through the ground realities of one of the most pressing issues in our country, the critical period, the formative first 1,000 days of a child's life, from conception to early childhood, to this unique virtual exhibition, the early years. This global event, organized between UK and India, aims to create awareness about this critical early childhood period, which has further been affected by COVID. This event is a part of an ongoing initiative to encourage and build awareness for public health man engagement. The event focuses on how art can be a powerful tool to reach a wider audience for their impactful intervention, along with current practices around the nutrition of both mother and child, as well as steps taken to raise public awareness. To extend the message, we request each one of you to participate and post messages or reviews on your social media handles to make this event more engaging. To kickstart this phenomenal event, I would like to invite Professor Monica Lakanpal, Professor Integrated Child Health, Pro Vice Provost South Asia, UCL, to say a few words. Monica, over to you. Thank you, Vishy. Namaste, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to be here before you to share with you all this exhibition and webinar, co-created between our friends at Indira Alliance and our team at UCL. It was 18 months ago when after one of the Indira Alliance panel meetings, meeting Shahid, the previous CEO, and I discussed the importance of public health, policy engagement, and community engagement as an essential ingredient of research. And we wanted to ensure that all the research we do has action, change, and impact, and that's why we're here today. Interestingly, that one moment of two people sharing a cup of tea over an idea and discussing in Hyderabad what was important in the years to come, followed by my kind um, colleague Vasan, the current CNO, who has continued to support this journey, has led us to be here with you today. So firstly, a huge, huge thank you to you all for joining us, but also the whole team at Indira Alliance and UCL, who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to bring us here today. Just a few people to briefly name before we go on. I'd like to say thank you to Sarah, Nicolette, Banya, Professor Supramna, who will be our moderator later, Karthik, our co-lead, Alex, our curator, Hemant, whose photographs you will see, and also Sophie from UCL at Priam as well. And there's all so many people behind the scenes who I cannot name, um, but of course Vishy as well, who's our chairperson. But what this shows you and shows us all is that if there is a common goal, if there are good relationships, good understanding, patience, and along the way, some laughs and some smiles and sometimes some tears at difficult times, a dream can come true even at these difficult times and during COVID when we can't meet face to face. And this difficult time has been devastating, not only for ourselves, but for so many children globally. We are already still in a challenging position. We know that previous to the COVID epidemic, there was malnutrition, stunting, mental health problems, maternal health problems, low birth weight, and yet COVID has just devastated that even more. We have been taken back years. We have been working towards the sustainable development goals, tirelessly all holding hands together. Yet what has happened to those? We have moved backwards and the work starts again. And we are at real risk of how, what happens to our children to get them out of this hole that we're seeing ourselves in. As Nelson Mandela says, the true character of society is revealed in how it treats its children. And over the next few years and longer, everywhere in the world, 
society's character will be tested by how much and what type of action we take and how we address the first thousand days of a child, which starts in conception through to childhood. Many have asked me, when we have so many other problems in the world, why should we focus on the early period in a child's life? Surely there are many other periods in a person's life that we should be focusing on. Well, you'll hear a lot more about this later. But in summary, this is because the first thousand days is when the brain is growing at its fastest rate, making connections at an incredible pace so that a child is ready to learn and engage with the world. We need to support these children to enable them to learn, to enable them to speak, to enable them to build relationships. And we can only do that if we support them during this critical period. What are the key ingredients that a child needs from conception to early childhood? Good nutrition, safe and nurturing environment, play and positive interactions with the world around them, and a protection from harmful experiences, such as domestic violence, isolation, child abuse and malnutrition, which all have set, been set backwards in these years that we have just recently seen. And if we don't tackle this critical time, we are on a very, very rocky road for the future. This is why it is our duty to give our children the best start in life. And we wish that we can do that as a society. And we hope today we will start a dialogue in that way. We need to come together, work together and move in the right direction. But as you can see, I've said a lot of words today and you'll go away from this webinar and you'll forget most of what I say, I'm very sure. And that is why people say a picture is worth a thousand words. Yet scientists have spent much of their time writing wonderful and important scientific publications. But unless this important work reaches the public, reaches the policymakers, it is likely to have little impact and bring about little change. When we think about children, the first thing they do is hear their mother's voice. Then they see shapes and the written word comes very late. So humans, we are well visual by nature. So today we will be discussing the power of arts as a tool for communication, engagement and action, which will be more, than, more and more critical than ever in the post COVID world. But before I move to the next section, I wish to read you a poem. I wrote this poem after a visit to um, the fields um, and to the tribal villages and um, based on a project from Chile, which we'll see some photographs later on. And what I realized was it was difficult for me to get across to you all what we had seen. And you're not going to read all the publications that we write. So I've put a little poem together for you. I hear my mother cry at night, watching the morning sun catch light. She walks to the field, barefoot and tired, to fill my belly while squeezing me tight. No time to play, no time to sing. She leaves me home with an empty tin. She fetches the water from the well far away, balanced on her head as she comes home to play, pray. She coughs by the fire whilst preparing the food. So tired is she, but never shows her mood. She sweeps the floor as she makes our bed, no time to rest or lay down her head. So I ask myself, can this be fair? And actually, does anybody care? So I hope today we all care, we all come together, we all discuss, and then we all take action. Thank you very much. Over to you, Vishy. Uh, thank you, Monica, for a very moving poem and an insightful perspective. With this, we hope that all of us achieve a better understanding and look forward to an engaging next few hours. On this note, I would like to invite Dr. Karthik Sharma, filmmaker and founder, Pahus, and co-lead of the Early Years Exhibition, to raise the curtain on the Early Years Exhibition Space Launch, where science and art come together. The virtual tour will illustrate an exhibition of photos and artwork from the Panchil Project India, a collaboration between UCL and Save the Children, and selected artwork from the Birthing a Better Future Art and Science exhibition by Zero to Expo, founded by Alex Flosherts, originally launched in the House of Commons UK. 
The event housed at Pahos also includes artworks such as digital illustrations, infographics, creative posters, and short films collected from Indian urban, urban and rural artists and poems by Monica herself. We even have a gallery of drawings collected by Hemant Chaturvedi demonstrating children's experience during and post COVID. For further information and to view the virtual gallery after the event, please visit www.pahus.org slash early years pass. Over to you, Karthik. Thank you, uh, Vishy, uh, for that uh, kind introduction. I think we now have a video which will be played, which will be introducing the web page and the virtual gallery which we have created to act as a sustainable uh, engagement tool even after today's session. So may I please request... Uh... Welcome to the Early Years, a window of opportunity, a global art and science exhibition. This exhibition, conceptualized by Professor Monica Lakhanpal from Institute of Child Health, University College London, has been executed in partnership with India Alliance. The exhibition is co-led by myself, Dr. Karthik Sharma, founder of PAHOS, where the exhibition will be housed, while the artwork has been curated by Alex Flosches, founder of Zero to Expo. Our aim here is to raise awareness on child health in India, highlighting the formative first 1000 days from conception to early childhood. Using unconventional and innovative methods of public engagement, harnessing an emotional medium of arts and films, as compared to traditional siloed approaches of dissemination using research papers and research conferences. Here, we have co-created a moving and informative multimedia experience for your interest, contemplation and action. The objective of this initiative being to create evidence for more such innovative endeavors directly engaging the public in public health. We aim to evaluate this exhibition with a short pre and post exhibition survey. We would be much grateful for your support for this effort by taking the short survey at the start and end of the exhibition. Moving to the curation aspects of this exhibition, as you can see in the virtual exhibition map, we have catalogued the artwork under different sections. Firstly, under the Creative Entries tab, Section A has artwork that was received as part of the call for entries from public health and medical institutes, research organizations, as well as from artists who have explored public health themes to capture an aspect of co-creation while Section B captures lived experiences from the communities in rural areas. As part of a campaign, activities with children were organized in Nagarya Panchela School, Dangarpur, and a community member's home in village Pandli, Dangarpur, Rajasthan. For both sections have been catalogued as part of a PDF and can be viewed at your convenience. The entries catalogued on the PAHO space in both sections will be further exhibited as part of a physical exhibition in India soon, uh, well that is COVID permitting. If I may add, to respect the content creators, we would appreciate if no artwork is used for any personal or commercial use without the written consent of the artists. We would be happy to facilitate the same. The virtual gallery was commissioned by Professor Monica Lakhanpal, the project PI, and has been curated with the expertise of Ms. Alex Flosches. This exhibition is an amalgamation of two international initiatives, both addressing the first 1000 days of a child's life, and to form one exhibition. In the true spirit of art, capturing feelings and emotions towards motherhood that transgress all barriers and boundaries.
This exhibition has pictures from the Panchil project which had Professor Monica Lakhanpal as the PI. Panchil was an interdisciplinary cross-sector study designed to explore the HEEE that is health, education, engineering and environment factors that influence infant and young child feeding practices and nutrition in India. This project was a collaboration between UCL and Save the Children India. The full list of the partners have been listed below and a link has been provided to the project page. The pictures from the Panchir project on discussion with India Alliance Fellows were broken down into five key themes. The exhibition too has been curated keeping these themes in mind to engage the audience with India specific policies and build on ongoing efforts of the government of India such as with Clean India Mission, Potion Abhiyan while aligning them with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The themes that were shortlisted are Education, Growth and Development Nutrition and Care Practices Infections Environment that includes Social, Family and the Natural Environment and lastly, Impact of COVID-19 on the Early Years Secondly, in the exhibition, we have paintings from Birthing a Better Future, Art and Science Exhibition by Zero to Expo. Originally launched in the House of Parliaments by Alex Flosher. Through the medium of paintings and photographs, this artwork aims to articulate the journey of a mother from conception to early childhood. All the pictures and artwork curated in the virtual gallery have inbuilt text boxes which share the artist's details and delve further in the essence of the creative pieces. Fully recorded conducted tour of the virtual gallery can be found here and can be viewed at your convenience. To make this virtual exhibition a truly interactive experience with a component of co-learning, we have provided a common space where audience members can leave their thoughts, learnings and suggestions for our future public engagement initiatives. We will be much grateful if you can please spare a moment to undertake the post-exhibition survey at the end of the exhibition. The Early Years team thanks you for your time and consideration and we hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. That was a truly inspiring session. It brings a profound balance between science and art, as well as the thought process behind each artwork. With such a collaboration, 
we try to bring about an exemplary initiative of raising awareness of critical matters such as maternal and child health and its ongoing challenges and solutions. For the next session, we are proud to bring you experts from relevant fields of art and science who shine light on the power of art in public health. In this panel, we welcome Mr. Tol Singh, former community researcher, the Panchseel Project, Mr. Raghu Rai, renowned photographer and photojournalist from the Raghu Rai Center of, for Photography, Sir William Mark Tully, author and former bureau chief, ex BBC chief, New Delhi, Mr. Saurav Sain, senior consultant, media, Vigyan Prasar, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, Mr. Sudarshan Suchi, CEO, Save the Children, Ms. Som Mitra, founder director, Blue Palette, Professor Monica Lakan Paul, Professor of Integrated Child Health, Pro Vice Provost South Asia, UCL. This session would be moderated by Dr. Karthi Sharma, filmmaker and founder of Pahus and co lead of the Early Years Exhibition. Over to you, Karthi. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vish Veshwar, for your kind introduction. And if we may now move swiftly into this very exciting panel discussion on the power of arts in public health. As my colleagues already introduced, we have an interdisciplinary mix of professionals from scientists encouraging the use of arts in health to artists articulating health and social issues through their craft. And lastly, media professionals who through their individual and organizational efforts have been engaging with the masses. Before we dive right into this eclectic session, it will be only right to explore the human side of this initiative by hearing few words directly from the members of the public that we aim to engage and empower. On that note, may I please request a short video message from a community champion from the Panchi project in Banswara. Uh, presenting Mr. Tol Singh, please. Namaskar, Satcho. मैं तोल से मुझे राजस्थान के बांसवाड़ा जिले के आदिवासी बिल समुदाय से आता हूं। पिछले पंद्रह वर्षों से मुझे कई संस्थाओं के साथ में जुड़ करके कार्य करने का अनुभव रहा है सन 2017 और 2018 में सैदी तिल चिल्ड्रन संस्थान के साथ जुड़ करके जीरो से दो वर्षों तक के बच्चों के स्वास्थ्य और पोषण के ऊपर और अधिक जानने व समझने का मौका मिला है मैं इसी क्षेत्र से होने के नाते और इसी क्षेत्र का और इसी समुदाय से होने के नाते मुझे काफी सारी समस्याएं समस्याओं के बारे में पहले से ही पता था लेकिन इसमें और अधिक अच्छी मजबूत समझ बनाने में मेरा मेरे को अवसर मिला है माता पिता के पास बच्चों को समय ढंग से नहीं दे पाते हैं क्योंकि वो रोजगार के लिए अपने रोजी रोटी के लिए दिन भर व्यस्त रहते हैं उनके दिमाग में वही रहता है कि हम कहाँ पर आज काम है काम पे जाएंगे कहाँ पर हमको मजदूरी मिलेगी तो उनको बच्चों के साथ मिलना उनके उनको समझ उनके साथ में समय देना ये उनके दिमाग में रहता नहीं है पहले प्रायोरिटी रहती है उनकी रोजगार की इसके बाद में बच्चा सेकंड प्रायोरिटी पर रहता है माँ का समय पर दूध नहीं पिला पाना ये भी बहुत बड़ी समस्या यहाँ पर है क्योंकि माँ अपने कार्य के लिए ईंधन का कुछ सामग्री जुगाड़ करने के लिए या खेती बाड़ी के लिए या मजदूरी के लिए निकल जाती है जब तक बच्चा रोता नहीं है तब तक वो माँ दूध नहीं पिलाती है जो कि वास्तविक जो टाइम पे दूध पिलाना चाहिए वो दूध नहीं पिलाने के कारण स्वास्थ्य पे ऊपर बहुत बुरा प्रभाव पड़ता है बुखार दस्त निमोनिया जैसी बीमारियां होने पर वो अस्पताल नहीं जाते हैं पहले वो भोपाल को बताएंगे दो तीन दिन निकलने के बाद में यदि वो ठीक नहीं होता है तो बाद में जा करके वो हॉस्पिटल जाते हैं जो कि बहुत देर हो चुकी होती है और बच्चे के स्वास्थ्य पर गहरा प्रभाव पड़ता है इन्फेक्शन का ज्यादा खतरा रहता है क्योंकि वो एक ही छत के नीचे रहते हैं गाय भैंस बकरी मुर्गी और खाना सोना सभी एक साथ एक ही छत के नीचे होता है जिस कारण से काफी कुछ बीमार गंदकियां वहां पर रहने के कारण छोटे बच्चे के इन्फेक्शन के बहुत खतरा बन जाता है साथ ही यहाँ पर पौष्टिक आहार नहीं मिल पाना भी बड़ी समस्या है क्योंकि दिन भर माँ बाप काम पर में व्यस्त रहते हैं 
उनको क्या खिलाना कितना खिलाना किस उम्र में क्या खिलाया जाना चाहिए इसके बारे में कोई संवेदनशीलता बच्चों के प्रति नहीं है वो अपने रोजमर्रा के कार्य में व्यस्त रहते हैं बच्चा रोता है तो उसको रोटी का टुकड़ा उसको पकड़वा दिया जाता है बच्चा चूसता है लेकिन उसको वास्तविक जो आहार मिलना चाहिए वो नहीं मिल पाता है जो कि बच्चे के स्वास्थ्य में बहुत गहरा प्रभाव पड़ता है साफ पानी का नहीं हो पाने के कारण भी यहाँ पर इन्फेक्शन के काफी खतरे बढ़ जाते हैं यहाँ पर माता और बच्चे को टीकाकरण भी समय पर नहीं मिल पाता है और कभी कभी तो उसको मिलता भी नहीं क्योंकि वो मजदूर के लिए कहीं ना कहीं चले जाते हैं सीजनल पलायन कर जाते हैं जिस कारण से उनको जो टीकाकरण एवं सरकार की अन्य सुविधाओं से भी वंचित होना पड़ता है मुझे लगता है कि जीरो से दो वर्ष तक के बच्चों के पोषण और स्वास्थ्य के ऊपर कार्य करना बहुत आवश्यक है क्योंकि यदि उनको अच्छा स्वास्थ्य और पोषण नहीं मिले तो उनका शारीरिक विकास नहीं हो पाएगा और शारीरिक विकास नहीं होगा तो उसका उनका मानसिक और बौद्धिक विकास नहीं होगा यदि मानसिक और बौद्धिक विकास नहीं होगा तो उनका सोचने समझने की तर्क शक्ति नहीं रहेगी वो जीवन भर मजदूर और गरीब बने रहते हैं जिस कारण से यहाँ पर ये देखने को मिल रहा है कि वास्तविक इस पोषण के ऊपर कार्य करने की बहुत आवश्यकता है मैं इस क्षेत्र से हूँ इस क्षेत्र पर पाला फला और इन समस्याओं से जूझा हूँ मुझे पता है कि किस तरीके से यहाँ की समस्याओं समस्या है और उन, उनसे जूझना पड़ रहा है मुझे लगता है कि इन लोगों के बीच में रह करके इस समुदाय के बीच में रह करके हम अच्छा सा संवाद स्थापित करें और संवाद स्थापित करके यहाँ पर एक साझी समझ बना करके हम इस क्षेत्र में पोषण और स्वास्थ्य के क्षेत्र में अच्छा काम कर सकते हैं जिसमें हम भजन संगीत वीडियो फिल्म नुक्कड़ नाटक दीवार पर लिख करके चित्रों के माध्यम से ऐसी कई गतिविधियां करके हम इस समुदाय के साथ मिल करके एक अच्छी साझा समझ बना करके और पोषण और स्वास्थ्य के क्षेत्र में अच्छा सा काम किया जा सकता है जो कि ये बहुत आवश्यक है मुझे आशा है कि फिर हम सभी मिल करके इस समुदाय के साथ मिल करके इस पिछड़े समुदाय को समाज की मुख्य धारा में लाने के लिए स्वास्थ्य और पोषण पर कार्य करना बहुत आवश्यक है और उससे हमारा योगदान रहे ये इसी आशा के साथ मैं अपनी वाणी को यहीं विराम देता हूँ धन्यवाद uh well thank you i think uh this video really goes on to show the true motivation we have behind this exhibition in engaging with the public in a language that everyone can understand may i therefore request the first speaker who like all speakers will have five minutes to share their insight on the framed questions once all the speakers have had the chance to speak on the individual questions we will open the house for a brief q and a with the members of the audience If I may please start with uh, Professor Lakhanpal, uh, Professor, with the many leadership hats you wear, such as of a senior academic and vice provost South Asia at UCL, integrating the arts in your research projects, can you share with us your experience and motivation for exploring arts as a communication tool for maternal and child health awareness? Thank you very much, Karthik. And I think you've seen the motivation if you hear what Tol Singh says. and how he from the community suggests what we should do that's really the prime motivation here but as you know and many other people know i have three other hats on well i'm a doctor i'm a practicing doctor so i see patients still and yes i'm an academic researcher but i'm also a mother as well so it's really when i reflected recently that i realized that being a mother i communicate with my children when they were younger through the arts every day through books through reading through pictures and also being a doctor every time we communicate with the children with the parents we teach them about parenting we use pictures we do drawings we constantly use art in everyday life even the stickers we use when children bed wet it's all art in one form or another and we share these drawings and we share these pictures on an everyday basis so it's sort of part and parcel of my life yet it's not something that we ever discuss in our roles and nothing that we really go into the depth with um with our academic work or hasn't been before for me so it really came to life i have to say even though it was part of my life um it came to life for me from an academic perspective 
really when I visited um, Banswara, the tribal villages in Rajasthan on the Panchil project, there were three things that I saw there. One was in the Angavari centers, people, the community themselves had already painted the walls, already put messages on the walls of healthy eating, and which was amazing to see that they had taken the initiative for this. In the evenings, and Tulsing will know this, and Pramod and Hemant and others on the call will know this, we had a session where we all went round the table, um, either telling jokes or actually um, singing a song. And some beautiful folk songs came out with very clear messages within the songs, which I was thinking, well, why are we not utilizing these community engagement, artistic approaches more effectively? And thirdly, when we brought the photographs back from the field and we looked through them and we created a beautiful book with them, it made it stick into my mind that actually, as I said earlier, all the reports I write, anything that we do will not stay in people's minds. But these photographs you see have moved me and will remain with me through the rest of my life more than anything else I write. So this really made me think, what do we need to be doing in research? How can we use arts as a public engagement and communication tool, but also as a research methodology as well, to elicit the feelings and emotions of the people we work with. So in a way, it was like having two hands. Why does arts and sciences have to be separate? You know, arts is one hand, science is another hand, and if you bring the two hands together, they have greater strength and greater value. So why can we not integrate these two approaches and not be so afraid that they're totally different disciplines and they work in different silos. I then had another experience of working in South India with my colleagues, um, using participatory theater to address mental health literacy. And again, it was so obvious that you, through arts, you could get over some of those boundaries and some of those barriers that otherwise, when we talk to each other, we may keep um, some of these um, covers or, or clothing around us because we're too scared to share and art breaks boundaries and that's really why I thought to myself how can we as artists, scientists, practitioners, policy makers use art more effectively in public engagement, social change and impact and have greater impact and value working together in this way. So that's really my motivation and experience and I hope that helps you Karthik. Well, well, thank you. Indeed, very interesting arts for breaking silos. That's, that's a very good point, Professor Lakhimpal. Thank you so much. And, and may I now pose my next question to Mr. Suchi. Uh, Mr. Suchi, as the present CEO of a 101-year-old NGO, improving the lives of children in India and globally. In the past, you have been closely working with rural communities for their social empowerment. Uh, can you please share your insights in the use of arts in participatory processes for engagement of primary stakeholders? Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Kathik. Uh, I, I hope my uh, voice is clear enough and reaching you. Been having some network there. So I, while watching your um, first clip, I was struck by a coincidence. You mentioned a district and a context, a Dungarpur district in Rajasthan. And that some 35 years ago was the first district and the first village I went to in my rural immersion was in Dungarpur, Rajasthan, place called Mada. That uh, There's one local NGO called Pedo there. And uh, uh, this is just totally unplanned, but also among various things while my work there was engaging with the watershed context rainwater harvesting and drought proofing but one of the earliest things at that time high on the agenda was uh, the crisis of prevalent from ringworm uh, infection which was coming through primarily the hand pumps operated there and through that rapidly spread so there was this whole campaigning context which used to go on communicating with a lot of trainings, a lot of communication about how to keep the hygiene and sanitation around the hand pumps and it had made little or no progress and then uh, I remember some local uh, school kids were invited for a competition that if you were to do this messaging 
the competition was organized actually in participation with nid national institute of design people on a development communication context so they drew two three very simple posters very direct very simple illustration which was what was no and what was yes no words no literacy nothing it was just symbolic art and the speed with which that message got spread was amazing i mean that's the earliest i can think of uh, that, that's in terms of there but you also poked me um, using the word participatory context so i i think when we look at now our work the um, the whole engagement with primary stakeholders in any context let's say in our case children uh, bringing their voices in or their parents vulnerable communities with whom we work the marginalized they don't always have the voice or the words if the voice is there to represent their ideas and in a structure in which we comprehend easily nor do actually we i mean we mostly in our communication we mostly manage to complicate things for them and sometimes do a re exactly reverse them and here i found the platform of art was a great unif unifier was a great democratizer which actually brought in all those stakeholders on a equity which no language would provide and in some cases suddenly the the ones on the margin and vulnerable were much more on top because their ability to express through art was far stronger than anybody so the kind of uh, let's say collaborative uh, platform which we could create co creation all those potentials got unlocked because of art so yes so i think the power of art is immense in that sense in leveling the experience yeah well thank well you. thank you mr suchi it's uh, it's so interesting we ha now have two common points not only uh, the power of arts but also the power of dangarpur to initiate uh, our future conversations that was truly inspiring sir especially coming from a senior person like yourself from the save the children foundation and and we thank you for your inputs uh, my next question is for an artist using the arts as a way of healing uh, ms soma you graduated towards being committed to using arts as a form of therapy for young children from initially having a career in finance uh, can you please share with us your experience of using arts as an emotional medium and its unrecognized power in being an effective engagement tool so the exhibition was uh, really thought inspiring so it was uh, really great uh yes i started my career with a in finance and then i graduated to a full time artist and art facilitator so see i have seen art evokes emotion when we do an art piece we actually pour our thoughts our feelings our uh, our mind into the art and when a person is viewing the art so he immediately relates to that art even as mr suchi said that there was a poster making competition with no words at all but still they can relate to that poster more faster than whatever information more faster than verbal information so there a communication is established whenever there is an art piece so that is the emotional uh, side of art but now uh, saying that so when uh, there is a social issue and when you want more public engagement see it should be an activity where uh, people from diverse background and diverse ability like it is speaking of ability can participate now see i have seen and you all must believe you we all are artists somewhere see a child starts with an expression of art even before he speaks everyone uh, suppose he is a scientist or an architect everyone is doing some kind of art or not like when we are doing a cell structure we are drawing a solar system we are drawing a uh, machine design we are doing art so we all are artists so in that way when we do a uh, activity in art for mass engagement we can have the maximum participation i must say and another thing see 
when it is, comes to art, it draws responses without much prompt. You just give them the topic, you just give them the issue, and see, when there is a global or a, a mass issue, a social issue, there are various viewpoints. And when you are bringing them to a platform of art, you are giving them the chance to show their viewpoints. So all these viewpoints, when you have uh, displayed all these viewpoints, that influences more thoughts, more discussions, solutions come up, more engagements happen, and uh, you know improvements also happen in a huge level. So that is one of the very important power of art. Like, uh, and when people get engaged in mass activity, they feel socially empowered. You know, they think, yes, I have a role to play. So otherwise, we get information, but we somehow don't feel the connection to that information. I will just take the example of Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, the Clean India Abhiyan. So it was a great idea, but it was practiced by only a few who were aware. Now, after that, socially, we uh, started decorating our slums, decorating our cities with wall art, with uh, street exhibitions, with murals, and that involved localites, children from the localities. And now, see, the people who used to litter that area, they are taking care because they feel that connection. They, they can identify with that art. So there lies the power of art, you know, uh, uh, a really powerful tool, I must say. Wow. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Ms. Sumai, for such a moving iteration of the power of arts to engage and to transform. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my, my, my next question now is to a person whose photographs highlighting social causes have been able to move and mobilize millions of people globally. But I'll suggest that you ask our dear friend Mark Tully. He has got a lot more to say because I didn't agree with you in participating such a debate because I am uh, not very educated in these matters. So if Mark throws more right and this gentleman also comes in, maybe I'll have a few words. <laughs> I'll borrow a few words and talk about art, so-called ca art, photography, and the effects we can create and the changes we can bring into this mighty world unbelievable please so let them speak <laughs> I, well so, so mr raghurai so can i can i on that note leave you with your question uh and then uh, perhaps come back to you uh so uh, my, my question was uh you know they they say a picture can be worth a thousand words while you yesterday mentioned sir that a thousand words can be a lot of noise correct so on, on, on that note, uh, please take your time if you want to respond now or later. On, on that note, can you share with us your experience with the impact of photography uh, that can have, which can be a bit helpful to better articulate an issue, um, if I may add in a very silent way in, in betwixt all the noise. So how can photography be helpful to articulate an issue as you pointed out here uh, perhaps this not very convincing so would you like to answer now sir or all right then. Should we? <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad yes. like yesterday i on, on today also i was able to uh, please go you on, see sir. i have engaged myself in several of these kind of aspects of, of our daily lives and their problems especially related to children because children, they get in, in, in our society, we used to hear that I'm sure everybody can understand it. This is sure. our common treasure. But what I see on the ground, what's happening to our children, I tell you, let me tell you, you know, we have a farm 13, 14 kilometers from here. I go there every weekend. I see the children of the village. And I, when I'm coming back, I see more children walking this way, that way, bare feet, not enough clothes. Huh? And I wonder, 70, we shall be celebrating 75 years of India's great independence, the great nation on the move. 
and I see no change whatsoever on in the ground reality except the noise we make. And we get noticed and we write about it and we take pictures, they come and they disappear with the time. Uh, you see, uh, they say uh, journalism is the first draft of history. I'm sure Mark will love this idea. <laughs> first draft of the history. If journalism is the first draft of the history, then photojournalism is the first evidence of that history. Now, having said that, how many photographs in this world? I mean, millions of pictures are taken every day. But how many of these photographs have the sensitivity, intensity, and power to stir up the world? Very rarely, very few things happen in this world. Even my picture of an un uh, burial of an unknown child, Bhopal gas tragedy, became a symbol of Bhopal gas tragedy. But then their campaign, there were several organizations getting after them. We created an exhibition with green, uh, what's called that inter in international organization, G Greenpeace. And they took that exhibition to several capitals of the world and in India also the exhibition was shown and some change happened the government shelled out some more funds for the poor uh, and few other things happened but I see you know none of these efforts have that power to bring about the change and we are sitting on this change and see how empowered we are and we, we shall be changing the this 75 years of India's independence bull. You know, social change is more important than to create the power of art and the power of photography. If there is no social change, if there is no education on a lower level, if they don't have food and shelter, proper food and shelter, how can they think of uh, you know doing anything else in this world? And most of our people, I'll say 30, 40 percent of our lives in India are like little animals. They go on living. Every dayness of life is so chaotic, so painful that it doesn't give them a chance to wake up. I have done a project with Save the Children also. I have done so many other things you know, on various levels. And when I look back, I say, oh, God, oh, that was there for some time for few, few people. That's the way I look at it. Photography is the most direct of arts uh, because this is seeing is believing. But how many photographs have the potentiality and power to transmit the reality in it, its depths? You know? it, this is what matters. I remember one of our photographers used to say, every picture that I take has a story to sell, tell. But is the, the, every picture that you've taken, is the, are those stories worth sharing? Do they have anything specific to point out? You know, and today in the world of Instagram and all this, so much else is happening in technology. It's become a photograph has become a joke. You know? And I don't know how much change it can bring about, you know. Precisely, you know, that you do it when you're doing it, you are all involved, committed to it. Because just now, that's your assignment. But the assignment is gone, and people have seen the pictures. A few who come to the gallery, or a few who can pick up the books published. And that's the end of the game in India. And the social change is more important than power of anything else. Um, well, uh, well, thank you, Mr. Raya. Well, yeah, if uh, on this. Uh, well, as you said yesterday when I met you, uh, if sorry for digressing a bit, because you raise a very, very important and the essence, uh, an essential point here about the sustainability and just not doing it for, uh, you know, the form of it, but also for the substance of it. So you, so you said yesterday, you know, I don't know if anybody will be listening, 
So I said, no, sir, I will be listening. You know, so I would like to repeat that today also that we, I accept it perhaps as a challenge to, uh, as the founder of art. And we have this great team with Professor Monica Lakhanpal, who is committed. So all of us are committed. And perhaps uh, if not next year or in few years, few years, I wouldn't have to persuade you to come and you'll you know, happily come on board and say, okay, the, this person said something and he actually, or they actually did it. Yeah. Again, we shall do another project and we'll do it with great enthusiasm and commitment. And again, it will be shown to a few people. And again, I'll go home and you'll go home. Bye-bye for just now. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I don't have much to say. Mark, good to see you after a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, thank you very much. But, uh, thank you, Mr. Ray. Thank you, truly. Uh, uh, that was a very insightful uh, uh, discussion and point from Mr. Ray. And uh, if I now uh, moving to the point of engaging, as Mr. Ray said, that you know there is a lapse between engaging with the masses. So perhaps it's it's a good. Uh, um, nudge to move towards the media side of things. And if I may uh, pose my question to Mr. Sen, as uh, someone leading India's largest science and OTT channel with three decades of experience in India, UK and Southeast Asia, can you share with us the potential of OTT platforms for streaming public health awareness content to entertain and educate uh, the general audience? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karthik. Uh, you know, it's actually quite a bit in retrospect when I think uh, that when we started conceptualizing India Science, which is today uh, almost uh, known as the India's National Science Channel, uh, we did not really anticipate that in about a year, within a year of its inception in January 2019, that the Science Channel would almost entirely be driven by the genre of health. We had thought that when we are creating a science channel in a country of 1.3 billion people, uh, it would merely be you know, uh, some kind of a competitor to the Nat Geos of the world and the discoveries of the world, uh, all, the, all the comparative aspects set aside, of course. But when we set it up and when we were about to complete a year, we realized that COVID had set in and, you know, we were literally breathing health content day in and day out. And all other genres of science and technology content had to take a back seat. Now, having gone through this last year of the pandemic and the lockdown and having uh, literally driven this channel with the help and support of every single research lab and academic institution which has been at the forefront of fighting the COVID menace, I can tell you for sure that the one thing that an OTT channel uh, in India in the science and technology space has achieved is, if I may borrow uh, Mr. Ragurai's words as well uh, in part, that while media can create perception, an OTT channel, by virtue of being a digital product, can make that perception measurable. And it was very important for us during the entire course of the pandemic to figure out what kind of an impact is the content giving us. So if I may give you an example of a couple of types of small content elements that we could uh, muster up at very short notice. One was the progress of the vaccine development process. What is happening in which lab, etc. One of them, of course, was Bharat Biotech, which has today produced the, the co-vaccine uh, for us. Second was, you know, elements that could drive away myths. Am I going to get COVID if I do this? Am I going to be safe if I do that, etc., etc. And of course, there was a dearth of validated information. There were rumors flying by the dozens every hour. Uh, and there was an utter need to educate the people with validated information, as opposed to scattered 
non-validated information. So much so that we are all aware Google had even, you know, sent out a stricture that if you had any content that mentioned COVID, then it would be disqualified. So that's the kind of guardian role that we had to assume ourselves during this process. And I think where OTT as a technology came in very handy is that not only did it create perception, it actually helped us to measure the uh, penetration and impact, not just geographically, but also from the perspective of demographics. So we could actually tweak our offering, we could tweak our outreach perspectives and ensure that the kind of content that we are giving out to the people of India and of course uh, uh, worldwide is comprehensive, is measurable in terms of impact and is also uh, catering to the actual need and thirst of the people. And I think while doing so, we were also very conscious and that is where you see the, the element of art comes in, may not be literally, but uh, euphemistically say, uh, speaking, that we did deploy a lot of uh, cerebral brainstorming internally to ensure that the kind of films that we are making is not just uh, able to capture the imagination of the audience, but is able to uh, make him or her stick to the kind of content consumption patterns that we would like them to do with us. So it was not really, you know, uh, the trajectory of a channel taking birth and trying to make an audience grow commercially. But apart from the national duties that we were performing, I think it was a test in time that we were trying to help a nation in distress, a planet in distress. And we were trying to put art, fact, and technology together, bundled for the best impact for the greater good of citizens worldwide. Well, well, th thank you, thank you, Mr. Sen, uh, for your industry insight. It's it's very indeed very encouraging for content creators who would like to be exploring health themes. So thank you for that. Uh, well, my my final question is, is to a person whose opinion on matters Indian truly transgresses all geographic or intellectual divides. Uh, uh, certainly. Firstly, thank you for your patience. And uh, if I may ask you, uh, you, you have documented one of the most interesting and critical political and social turnings in India, if I may say so, with no full stops in India. Uh, if I may please ask you, sir, if there was one mass media channel you could tell public health professionals to focus on for mass engagement, what would that be? Um, in a way, I wouldn't like to answer that question uh, because I think that uh, every media um, has a role to play. And uh, to me, it's uh, highly significant to be involved in this enterprise today because one week ago, I was in a brick kiln in Haryana uh, and uh, I was uh, gathering material for a report which will appear in the Hindustan Times. Um, about the condition of the workers there, and in particular the condition of the children there, who are obliged to work because the uh, money the parents earn is so lamentable. And uh, that is an, a very interesting example of the problem we all face and the problem which Raghu talked about. Uh, I, ever since I came back to India in 1965, I have been reading about and periodically covering uh, reports on brick kiln labor. And the conditions now are just like they were. Yet this is a country which has passed laws um, to, um, about migrant labor. This is a country which has a Nobel Prize winner uh, for campaigning on children. Um, but still, all the journalism I've done, all the photographs Raghu has done, all the NGO campaigns, and I'm a great admirer of NGOs and a great admirer of their campaigns, still uh, this situation prevails. So certainly we need to think very hard as people in the media about what we can do to make our um, 
coverage more effective and to avoid the problem which, which Raghu so rightly pointed out, swooping down, covering a story and then disappearing. And if one has a heart, one quite often feels almost like a vulture as you descend on all people, uh, pick away at them to get their story and then you drive back or if you're lucky catch a train back or fly back to your air-conditioned room, a comfortable meal, one drink and some other. Um, the media though I would choose to point out, partly because of course it's my favorite media for working in myself, uh, partly because it's a highly neglected media, partly because it's a very effective media, is radio. Um, why is radio uh, particularly effective? Well, we've heard a lot about a picture. One picture is worth a thousand words. I want to tell you that the pictures which are made on radio are worth, uh, I won't say, uh, a thousand pictures, but what I would say is that one of the great uh, 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 features of radio is that it is a message which goes home, goes in. And why is that? Well, partly it is because when you're listening to radio, you have to make the pictures for yourself. And pictures which you make for yourself stick in your mind. At the same time, you have to concentrate, you have to use your uh, um, imagination. Um, you have to be involved in the thing, you know, in the program, in the broadcast, in what it is, whatever it is, in a way which is really quite unique, I believe. And I think uh, that uh, many of you uh, may have had the experience I had as a child of being read to by my mother um, before I went to bed. And those stories and that reading um, uh, is one I often, uh, is an experience I often think about uh, when I'm thinking about the experience of uh, radio. The other thing about radio and why it sticks to people's minds is because it is a bit like being read to. It is a very intimate media. And it's a media which enables uh, or which makes you think that the broadcaster is speaking to you and to you alone in a way which is very difficult to achieve by lecturing, very difficult to achieve certainly in television. And I remember when this was driven home to me once, by I had given, I was going to give a lecture in a town, beautiful town called Hereford in uh, Britain. And uh, Far more people came than I expected to come. So I said, well, I didn't know what all you people have come for, because I'm a clapped out journalist. Um, I'm not a great, uh, highly skilled writer or anything like that. And after the, uh, after the uh, lecture was over, an old lady came up to me and she said to me, I've come here, I want to tell you, I've come here because I regard you as my friend. And I think that is an example of the impact that radio has because uh, of, of its directness. So I believe that radio is underused and has a great power. And I'd just like, before I finish, to mention two particular types of radio, which can be very effective, I believe. And one is the daily or weekly serial format. Um, you know, in England, there is a serial called The Archers. And the intention of that serial originally, way back uh, in the early 50s, uh, was to pass on information about farming, because it's a rural program, basically. Um, but the program is still running. It is the longest running drama in the world. It's every week, every day, 
uh, except oh, every weekday, certainly, and on Sunday there's an omnibus edition. And of course, it does contain a lot of health uh, messages as well, particularly in this COVID time. Another message which uh, it, it conveyed, which is very much a health message, was uh, on drug abuse and um, how that should be handled and how that should be prevented. Uh, so that's one type of radio. And I have a friend who for many, many years uh, in Afghanistan, in the, all the difficulties of living in Afghanistan, and he's an Englishman, ran a daily what they call soap opera. And it was very successful and it was facilitated by NGOs who felt this was a wonderful way uh, of getting their message across. And the other form of radio, which I think is very effective uh, in a specialized way, is community radio. And of course, that has the great advantage of being able to focus narrowly on local issues. And because you can bring in uh, so many more people have a chance to communicate in, in, um, uh, in community radio. They're not kept, kept out by professional broadcasters like me who hold the air. Um, and for that reason as well, I think it's a highly effective use of radio and a highly effective communication medium. And I just end by saying this, that we're talking about the power of art in public health. Well, writing is an art. And writing for radio and producing radio programs, and I emphasize producing because far too often it's the writer which gets all the kudos, whereas the producer is hugely effective. But if you've been involved in radio programs like I have been, you will realize that they are, in their way, works of art. Wow. Well, that was. Thank you, uh, Mr. Turi. That was very interesting and um, uh, something for a lot of uh, food for thought for us to uh, think about and plan our future uh, initiatives. And uh, on, on a lighter note, if you uh, allow me to, uh, perhaps uh, Freddie Mercury from the Queens would uh, also agree with you when he wrote the song, you know, Radio Gaga. And uh, we, 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 yeah. So we are completely uh, grateful for your very helpful suggestions and and food for thought. Thank you, thank you, sir. And Would well, uh, well, that has been a truly uh, inspiring and and thought provoking, and and indeed an honor for me to be interviewing such uh, uh, or sorry posing questions to such stalwarts as Sir Mark Twilley, Mr. Raghurai. Uh, Professor Monica, Ms. Soma, Ms. Darshan, Ms. Sora, thank you for your for your time. But uh, we have some time, and it'll be uh, only nice and proper if we open the house for some uh, quick questions uh, from the audience members. And uh, so, if we can please uh, open the house for any questions. So, if I can ask my first uh, question to uh, Mr. Sudarshan, there's a question for you, sir. Uh, do you, during your work, uh, during your time working closely with the rural communities, did you come across any folk artists undertaking health awareness initiatives? I think you touched upon it. Yeah. Uh, so actually, incredibly so across. I mean, including uh, so the one I was telling you earlier about was uh, Mada Dungapu, but uh, similarly in Madhya Pradesh in the Kond okay. Tribal Community, Central Madhya Pradesh around Sivni. Mandla, these districts. I mean, it's center to east Madhya Pradesh uh, province, and here, and then also around, of course, uh, one of our famed uh, rural health team has been search organization in Gadchiroli, Dr. Bang and team there. In both these places, uh, the the community mobilization essentially was leveraged by the folk artists. So. First was the messaging itself. The messaging was or the content, the art, the 
display across the wall or anywhere the medium itself was something far friendly and receptive for the community but you know one of the unintended uh, initially but later on powerful outcome was the credibility these people enjoyed with those communities so that credibility and goodwill also came to the message that if it's coming through this medium of this person then it's something that must kind of rise up to or attend or focus on um i, I remember um, i think uh, it probably soma who was illustrating about um, the government's program on swachh bharat for instance contact and various means of it including washing of hands or wash around wash contact so by and large wash inroads in india have has not been uh, made the inroads of successes have been much more riding on art and not on the science and facts of wash it so, i mean it's been on that last mile connect has come in the form of various forms of art art as in you know the, the drawing art art as in singing art as in various other performing arts and this one and uh, wall paintings incidentally as a form of art has been one of the biggest symbols of even transparency and accountability of what has been happening again in the same parts of central and i mean i, I could go on from ex, you know illustration to illustration on this but uh, yeah the, these were very powerful you would also know that, i mean I, you may not know there is a particular singer called pralath tipanya who is one of the folk uh, folklore persons who is uh, i mean uh, the messaging through him in and around devas again central india has been a phenomenal medium of communication and, and uh, yeah so infinite illustrations exist like that Yeah. Uh -huh. but you know i i would still underline the spirit behind all of it has been art resulting consequence art being democratizing or infinite opening and transparency of communication that that is is the part that has been the most proper contribution of art yeah thank you thank you mr sushi oh, well we have a, a, another question for uh, sir mark tuli uh, uh so if you can hear us uh there's a question for you do you do you feel in in uh, do you feel india is in slow motion in harnessing the power of media for engaging the masses on health themes or do you perhaps feel it's a, it's a global phenomenon well i would like to uh, pick on india on this Uh, but i do think uh, one thing about india and that is that uh, one gets a very strong impression that the concentration on in india has been on curative medicine and that public health um and the need for awareness on public health issues um has been neglected uh, compared with that um i think even if you take the swatch bara campaign uh, you have had an emphasis on one aspect of uh, of um public health uh, but uh, there has been no emphasis on uh, all the other aspects of public health which are involved in cleanliness in this country um uh, the just travel by train uh, out of delhi on any route you go on uh you pass mounds and mounds of of rubbish um that's uh, just littered around the place i'm not saying collected or anything like that um so that's an example of where you know there has been no real public awareness uh programs um I, I do think that public health is extremely important, and I do think that more needs to be done, much more needs to be done, to make people aware of it. Even in a city like Delhi, as you go into the Lodi Gardens or if you go into the Sunda Nursery, uh, particularly Lodi Gardens is particularly bad there. Um, 
you will find a litter just thrown all over the place. And then people complain and say, why are they, why is the corporation or why is the management of, uh, of uh, children's nursery not picking up this litter? Well, that just shows you um, how little uh, attention has been made to this health aspect. Um, because the people should be saying, why is the litter thrown? And if it is thrown, what can I do personally to pick it up and, uh, and uh, um, put it where it should be? So yes, definitely, I think we are behind, uh, but I think all countries probably are behind. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sir Tully. I think we have time for uh, one quick question. I think that's for Professor Luckin Paul. Uh, uh, do, do you feel, Professor, the avenues for an open dialogue between scientists and artists is increasing in universities and uh, other academic institutions? Um, thank you, Karthik. Um, is it increasing? Well, I'm not so sure. And, and hopefully um, the next panel will address this in more detail. Um, but I think this is part of the problem is the scientists, um, We this is what I was talking about in the silos. Um, scientists are in, in a really, we're all put in our own little houses or our own little boxes. And the question is, how do we bridge those houses and how do we bridge those boxes? And unless we have more integrated teaching, undergraduate and postgraduate within universities, unless we bring the arts and humanities within the science programs um, and vice versa, it's going to be very, very difficult to bridge that dialogue. So I know that in, in UCL itself, you know, we're a very, very interdisciplinary university, one of the biggest in the UK interdisciplinary universities. Um, and that's something we work very hard to have programs that allow people to do modules um, and to engage with people from the arts and the sciences together and that's really why we're here to get today is to try and promote that more but a lot of our universities are set up very separately um, and we'll hear later probably but you know the funding that comes into the universities is also very separate and the um, employment of the scholars is very separate so if we really want to change this we're going to have to create new individuals new people who actually can think from an integrated perspective and are trained in an integrated perspective from the moment they start out as scholars and um, graduates really. And so it's, I think it is the time we need to sort of think to ourselves, how do we move that dialogue? How do we move that training? And how do we change the leaders of tomorrow to think differently? Thank you, thank you. Professor, well, there, there are some questions for uh, Mr. Sen and uh, Ms. Mitra, but I see Vishweshwar is. Uh, Vishy, do we have time for. Uh, It'll eat into our break, uh, Kathy. That, if that's fine, we can take one more question. So otherwise. All right. So I'll ask uh, Mr. Uh, a quick response, perhaps, from Ms. Soma and Ms. Sorv. Uh, uh, Ms. Soma, were there any particular enabling factors? that you recognized while undertaking art therapy with children? Uh, see, it is the fun factor. People enjoy art. It is the appealing factor. So when uh, our children come, come for a therapy, you know, the, they see the crayons, they jump into it. And when Hello. you give them what they love, you but can make them do what you need, need them to do. I want to apply yeah, that is three. a very enabling and uh, facilitating factor, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, that's that's all from the power of arts. And I, I really thank all the panelists for sharing their thoughts and uh, experiences. And, and we hope, uh, as Mr. Rai uh, suggested, that it's just not a one off thing. And all of us, uh, we have a great support system from India Alliance, from UCL, all, and all, all of us, as Alex as an artist, so we all come together and keep moving towards uh, reaching our objectives and actually uh, engaging with those uh, children, uh, which uh, Mr. Tully and uh, Mr. Ryan, all the other panelists spoke about. So thank you so much for your time and do enjoy the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Karthik. Uh, thanks to all the panel members. That was indeed a very illuminating discussion, I must say. And we've got lots to cover. So before we get into the next session, I suggest that we break for about 10 minutes and come back. Thanks to all of you once again. Good to see all of you. Uh, a very warm welcome to each one of you. Let's uh, get into our next session, a panel discussion towards a multi-pronged approach to support the early years where we have very well-known personalities, including Dr. Nachiket Moore, visiting scientist from the Bandon Academy of Leadership in Mental Health, Dr. Ivita Fernandez, Chairperson Fernandez Foundation, Dr. Anurag Kutpar, Professor and former Head of Department of Physiology, St. John's Medical College, and an India Alliance Fellow, Ms. Ashi Kathuria, Senior Nutrition Specialist, World Bank, Ms. Rebecca Fairbairn, Director, UKRI India, and Professor Vijayaragavan, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. This session will be moderated by our India Alliance Fellow, Dr. Suparna Ghosh, Professor and Head of Community Nutrition, Indian Institute of Public Health, Delhi, and PHFI. As we heard, a child's health and well-being depends on a positive environment, good nutrition, and positive parenting, and prevention of negative experiences. In this panel, uh, we aim to focus on how we can bring together funders, policymakers, scientists, and the public to address the first thousand days in the post-COVID time. In this theme panel discussion of towards a multi-pronged approach to support the early years, we will explore how an integrated approach from conception to early childhood can lay the foundations for a stronger and fairer society. Over to Suparna to take this forward. Suparna. Thank you, Vishy, for introducing our distinguished panelists. Um, a warm welcome to all our panelists. At the outset, I would like to thank India Alliance and Dr. Monica and her team for entrusting this important task of moderating this panel with such eminent experts. I'm excited and at the same time intrigued with the unique objective of Early Years Public Health Engagement Initiative, which intends to make the entire approach of intervening during the thousand days critical window period more inclusive while using a cross-sectoral lens. In this panel discussion, I shall try to engage with our panelists to dwell upon two important areas. The first one is the criticality of the strategy of addressing first thousand days for holistic development of the child. And the second one is the utilization of science behind art as an effective public engagement approach and a research tool. The first component entails identifying mainstreaming and strengthening strategies that not only address the direct causes of child undernutrition, which is critical during the first thousand days through nutritional interventions, disease prevention, but also the importance of covering the underlying and the basic causes of undernutrition, which equally impact child development, long-term health, and well-being. So the early years approach underscores the importance of creating an enabling environment that not only addresses nutritional and health needs of the child, but also nurtures the child to grow up to their full potential and contribute to the human capital asset of the country. Issues like education, sanitation, uh, uh, income poverty, livelihood, child care practices, play and sensory stimulation all need to be addressed and tackled and should complement the nutrition and health interventions. Additionally, this enabling environment is also important when the child is thriving in the womb. So empowering the woman about her reproductive health rights and maintaining optimum mental health during pregnancy and later is crucial. For the second component, that is art in public health, we acknowledge that art can be a great platform to make science appealing, convincing, and comprehensible. But another way of looking at it is to see how art can be integrated into participatory research methods as validated tools for co-production of knowledge while we amplify the voices from the field. On this note, let us start our discussion today. So, so my question to our first panelist, uh, Dr. Evita Fernandez, ma'am, how in your opinion, empowering women about their reproductive health rights can actually create an enabling environment during the initial part 
of the first thousand days of life. How can this strategy be effectively integrated into ongoing reproductive and child health programs in the country? Over to you, Dr. Fernandez. Thank you, Subarna. Thank you very much. Um, to begin with, we well, the thousand days starts with conception, but as an obstetrician, I feel our strategy has to begin preconception. And it has to begin by empowering women, probably beginning the young girls in their late teens, telling them about their reproductive health rights and stressing the importance of, you know, when you get pregnant, you're not, you have to be physically fit, emotionally fit, medically, but more importantly, mentally fit. Uh, because, you know, uh, we've got enough studies now, particularly in the last decade, to show that mental health has tremendous problems on the, on the baby. And if we go to the next level, antenatally, antenatal care has to go beyond hemoglobin and uh, blood pressure and nutrition. Uh, I know India faces a tremendous challenge, women being malnourished and, you know, exposed to infection. But more importantly, I think we just need to address mental health issues, which we're not doing very well. Um, we, we, we're not even sure of the mental stress that a woman experiences. And particularly if our women uh, are fighting poverty, domestic violence, and the pandemic itself has increased the uh, impact of mental health. So that's an area that we really need to focus on. Uh, coming to labor and birth, uh, Professor Sue Down and McCott, way back in 2006, considered, proposed that labor should be considered a dynamic, salutogenic phenomenon, particularly if a woman enjoys an absolute physiological birth, where she's allowed to birth in an environment that's not just safe, but supportive, birth companion, skilled, compassionate staff, and that is a positive stress, which actually uh, the epigenetic priming is positive. Now compare this against a woman who doesn't know her reproductive rights, who's not primed with any kind of pre, uh, you know, labor classes, and goes into an environment where she doesn't know anybody. She's asked to birth alone, subjected to disrespect and abuse. And on top of that, suffers a traumatic experience. So you've got a mother who's depressed, who probably is so full of fear, and is not able to care for that baby. In that process, if she's not had a physiological birth and allowed skin to skin, the bonding between the mother and baby is affected. And we know the effects on that on babies. Finally, the mode of birth. We are fighting this epidemic of rise of C-sections huge in some areas 90 percent and we also know that the mode of birth children born out of unnecessary c-sections the long-term effects on the microbiome and these children have a higher risk of autism asthma allergic disorders childhood obesity diabetes thankfully all of this we could uh, reduce and take care of women better if we have professional midwifery. The Lancet series in 2014 has shown beyond any doubt that a country that invests in a strong midwifery workforce with midwives trained to global standards, 85% of maternal and newborn needs are met. And this includes mental health issues. So fortunately, India is committed to embedding midwifery into its system across all public hospitals, where 60% of our 25 million births happen. To me, that is a very big step towards handling the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernandez. Especially, I would just highlight one important point that it's not the conception, it's maybe before that. A life course intervention is what is desirable, and we, might, we should start with the adolescent girl or maybe, you know, the cycle goes on. So yeah. it is important to impress upon the common people that nutrition at all stages of life cycle is of importance and intervention at all the stages are crucial. Thank you so much for your valuable insight.
So we'll move on to our next uh, panelist, Dr. Nachiket Moore. Uh, Dr. Moore, though initiatives like Ocean Abhiyan are symbolic and reflect commitment and prioritization given to elimination of malnutrition in the country, how can we effectively integrate other sectors, education, wash, livelihood, care practices, and bring focus to voices from the community into this flagship program to address early years? Can we use art for public engagement to better explain some of the issues related to these related sectors? Over to you, Dr. Moore. Ma'am, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. Obviously, I'm in very distinguished company of senior scientists and doctors. Uh, I'm an economist by training, so really I don't have the kind of depth of knowledge that Dr. Fernandez has on some of these issues. Um, there are some areas in which uh, I've had uh, some engagement, though. Uh, and, and clearly, as you point out, uh, we need to look beyond. Unfortunately, the standard approaches um are not delivering the results that we need you know, the 2019-20 nfhs result is showing perhaps even uh somewhat of a regression uh on uh, nutritional standards and and while um you know there are a number of aspirations we have towards uh what the health system should do uh and how it should behave uh, in actual practice we are at a situation where in a state like bihar even uh, four ANCs, uh, fewer than 25% of the women are able to get. Uh, so really, we are at a very different level of performance in the system uh, than we uh, need to. And, and uh, one of the areas in which uh, I have certainly been somewhat interested is that are there other tools that we have that we can uh, try to explore? And one specific area when we spoke last uh, that I had mentioned to you was you know, the, the whole issue of what is going on in the home, do we really have a good understanding uh, of that? Right? Because there is this somehow the presumption that the mother, the family, uh, illiterate, uh, uninterested, constrained by poverty, um, is really not paying enough attention uh, to the child, perhaps. And really, why do we see uh, for a child that has minimal needs uh, with rising incomes, despite that, why do we see both macro and micronutrient deficiencies persisting. Uh, a state like Kerala has regressed. You know, one, this is shocking. Right? One would not imagine uh, that something like this uh, uh, would actually happen. Uh, one uh, project that uh, you know I've been somewhat involved in um, has been to try to look at uh, the whole uh, practice inside the home, uh, all the way from what Dr. Fernandez pointed out conception all the way to birth and then to child rearing. And as it turns out to this uh, August group, this would be no surprise that the child actually is far more important and far more central and child nutrition uh, is far more central and uh, important than one might imagine looking at it from the outside and looking simply at the results. And it's possible that we are seeing these uh, poor outcomes because we're not engaging with what is happening uh, with rituals uh, like, for example, uh, the Chhati ritual that you see uh, in Bihar, uh, where on the sixth day, there's a big focus on the child, on uh, what happens to the mother, and the community engages uh, with that child. Um, is it possible for us? And this is where perhaps the role of performing arts, perhaps the role of other mediums, you know, simply communicating a biomedical ritual uh, to the ASHA worker, who herself um, is a product of the community. In fact, this research shows that forget the transformation of the behavior of the mother. If you ask her, how has her behavior changed post all of this instruction and training, uh, actually the movement has not been uh, as much as you might have imagined. And then why is it surprising that you don't see the transformation that you expected to see in the way the families are behaving. Um, and, and the idea is, uh, can we, instead of ignoring or treating these rituals as, you know, atavistic, ancient, you know, uh, problems to be dispensed with, is there a way one can engage with them uh, much, much more carefully? That, of course, means we have to be much more responsive to the context. We can't use you know, to use a phrase that I learned recently, 
a traveling model. You know, an RCT produced some evidence somewhere, and then we stick it uh, in, um, you know, uh, in Bihar or in UP, uh, or even within UP on Shravasti, uh, and say, well, why is that not working? It has an evidence-based RCT supporting it. Um, it will need much, much more engagement uh, with what is happening with that ecosystem. And it's possible that the governmental effort, instead of being a closed, here is what I do, take it or leave it, uh, can it become more of a platform in which what it does, it uses these powerful uh, individuals, the Anganwadi worker, the ASHA, uh, as a kind of a platform effort to engage. And they know the local reality. They, they, they actually have a lot more latent understanding. Uh, we are using only 10% of what they know and their energy uh, instead of 90% uh, of what they are doing. Uh, and, and perhaps that's where some of the opportunities may be found. I, I will stop here, Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nachiket Mo, for your valuable insight. And just to reiterate the point, you know, we need to put ourselves in their shoes and understand their perspectives before messaging them with the standard messages that we have, giving a context to it, understanding the traditional behaviors, and utilizing those for our own benefit. You know, it's something which is a food for thought for us. So we'll move on to our next uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Ashi Kathuria. Um, Ashi, we all agree that cross-sectoral interventions in early years is critical. Uh, I wish uh, you could share with us uh, some experience from your, uh, like your working in the field in the developing country context when you have actually piloted or implemented any such holistic intervention to address the early childhood development. And the next part of my question is, could you tell us who can be the effective change agent as, and taking the conversation ahead from what, from what Dr. Moore just told us, that are, can we make Asha's Anganwadi workers the real influencers here? So, uh, so who will be the effective change agent in the community? And is there a scope of using art in making these interventions effective? Over to you, Ashi. Thank you, Suparna. And thank you to the big thank you to the organizers for having me on this esteemed panel. It is indeed a great, great privilege to have the opportunity to contribute to these discussions with, because this is a topic that I'm, I feel very passionate about. So to share some experiences from on the ground implementation of integrated interventions for early childhood development. And I would lay the emphasis on integrated because it goes beyond nutrition and health to incorporate uh, the experiences that I will talk about also incorporated, you know, early learning and stimulation for children, which is an area that is much ignored. And by early, I mean really early, from birth to their very early years. Um, these interventions are lacking a lot at the field level. The understanding of the need for children to have this stimulation amongst the masses is uh, quite missing, I would say. So I'm going to draw upon, uh, you know, two examples from South Asia developing context, uh, where the World Bank has supported uh, efforts to pilot these uh, integrated interventions at the community level. One is from the state of Meghalaya in India, and the other one is from the Sindh province in Pakistan. Very briefly, I'll explain what these uh, sort of what the interventions were and, uh, and what we learned from there. So um, both interventions were actually designed as pilots to test the operational feasibility of using large scale and existing program platforms uh, to deliver an integrated early childhood development parental guidance package. Because you know it's important. Uh, as we've learned to engage, uh, as we've discussed before and heard, uh, it's important to engage with communities and bring them in, into this as active, um, you know, uh, members of the whole program. So uh, that was the ultimate aim to see if program platforms that traditionally do not do these, can they deliver this package? So. 
Um, therefore, you know, we did not uh, include additional workers or any, but the whole package was implemented with uh, using the program mechanisms and their functionaries and uh, the workers who were already uh, doing what they were doing within the program. So in both the instances, the integrated package included counseling to promote positive behaviors uh, and practices related to nutrition, health, and early learning and stimulation during pregnancy, lactation, and early childhood. That is from birth to up to two to three years of age. Um, we had assessments built in to track changes in knowledge, attitude, practices, and also importantly to capture operational learnings, like what were the implementation challenges, what were the areas that could that need further strengthening, and you know what are some of the enablers that were there already that we could build upon. So very quickly in Meghalaya. Uh, the integrated interventions were implemented through the uh, Meghalaya State Rural Livelihood Program, which is like, you know, draws on the uh, livelihood, rural livelihood programs, the self-help, women's self-help group programs. And um, so uh, program functionaries and women's self-help group members, uh, some active members from the community were trained uh, to deliver this package in the local language at the community level. They use three channels uh, to promote and reinforce the packages. One is they talked about them at their self-help group meetings. Secondly, they made home visits and talked through targeted you know, homes with uh, pregnant women and children uh, and homes with young children. And then there were large community events specifically designed for wider dissemination because the idea was to make these changes part of the community norms and create an understanding about that. Uh, the pilot in Sindh in Pakistan was a very different one. It used a very different platform. It used the existing platform of the well-known lady health worker platform in uh, Pakistan, which has outreach to com the community level. Uh, and these health lady health workers already, as part of their uh, responsibilities, deliver counseling on nutrition and health. So this pilot incorporated the element of early learning and stimulation on to that that uh, you know along with their nutrition and health counseling and they delivered this through uh, you know their regular community counseling meetings as well as during home visits um, the pilots actually both pilots demonstrated the feasibility of using the two very different large scale platforms to deliver to deliver this integrated package uh, at the community level to parents while, of course, you know, many areas that were not perfect, we found many areas where further strengthening was required. Uh, overall, I think uh, uh, positive changes in knowledge, attitude, practices at the community level uh, were seen. Uh, and, you know, the communities as well as the functionaries were very appreciative of the intervention. And many mothers noting that, you know, the awareness and exposure empowered them to make to take better care of their children's nutrition, health, and stimulation needs. One of the most significant outcomes of working with these large-scale and established programs, I would say, was the commitment that was demonstrated by the program leadership once feasibility had been demonstrated. Uh, uh, and this was like, you know, to take these programs to scale. Uh, I think this happened because, you know, they were these program leaders and the programs were owners uh, and, you know, participants in the program. They actually implemented it. They were implementers and owners. They owned it. So, for example, in Meghalaya, convinced of the importance of early years, uh, Meghalaya has now established a full-fledged early childhood development mission statewide. And, you know, it is early years for that. And the purpose is really to address they recognize that there's a total lack of uh, early childhood development interventions in this quality interventions in the state and they want to take this to scale uh, in sin the early learning and stimulation module is now incorporated into the main it's mainstreamed into the lady health worker training module and all future workers will be trained in that aspect as well along with their nutrition and health counseling uh, the health department in addition so this is not an education program, but the health department is using their platform to reach children under three because no other programs are reaching uh, that age group 
under three and you know parents of uh, ch young children before they come to school. So the health department is committed to expanding this pilot in a phased manner across the province. Coming to your second point where you asked about creating effective change agents at the community level. So drawing upon these, this, these experiences, I would uh, like to note two points. The first one is that uh, let's capitalize on existing um, programs and the, that have an outreach. And let's capitalize on and build the capacity, empower functionaries or uh, you know, even volunteers who are engaged with these programs. And this would include you know, the Anganwadi workers, you know, workers of uh, Ash, uh, Ashas, and all of those kind of workers. But also, I think we must look beyond these programs. Uh, the self-help group platform, for example, uh, to do this, uh, because it engages community women, women, local women from the community. Uh, so we should also look at alternate because uh, I think that it's important that for change to happen, a critical mass of change agents at the community level is required. One single person doing a job of, uh, you know, bringing about change uh, of a large nature and at scale is probably not going to be enough. So it's important for all of our program, whatever platforms we use, to draw in communities, for example, bringing in community leaders, engaging them in whatever empower, uh, capacity building events that uh, are part of the program, bringing in motivated persons from the community. So, that, so such that, you know, because with this critical mass, that a norm is then established and changed at the community level to start focusing on these children. Now, engaging communities, if we have to reach children at scale in the early years, is actually very key. And this brings me to your third point, Suparna, about you know, the role of both science and art in making these interventions effectively and how we could do that. So you know, for the technical interventions, the science part of it, to be communicated effectively, I think it is extremely important that um, you know, they are delivered in a very effective manner. They are communicated effectively. Now, communication includes um, delivering that message in a manner that communicates simply and well, and also receiving by the receiver of that message in a manner that, that convinces them of making the, uh, the change. So, for example, you know, and that requires art to come in as a very crucial element. Giving the example of you know the sin, even creating simple picture cards uh, for use of the lady health workers at the community level to talk to the mothers or to play with the children, have the mothers learn how to engage their children, uh, required art to come in. Uh, another point that's very important really is the local context and uh, expanding the concept of art to look at uh, local art that exists and that's popular. For example, local songs, dances, folklore, grandma stories, etc. To, to weave those and bring them into, and we learned this actually as we were training the uh, community uh, workers, community ladies in Meghalaya. After they took these messages during group work, they created beautiful songs based on their local songs and tunes. They wove those messages and then they use them at the community level, you know, making some gestures and of dance, etc. with that, and they use that very effectively. One final point in regard to this I wanted to make was that uh, I think given today's day, um, day and time, and, you know, the access to films, social media, etc., I think combining art and using it in multiple media and forms expanding the definition to include short videos, short films, um, and performance arts, like which I mentioned earlier, is going to be very important to ensure that our message is not only, you know, interpersonal communication is one part, but reinforcement of these through these medium is also very important. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashi. I would just like to reiterate one point which you have said is that 
we already complain of burdening our ashas and anganwadi workers to give too many messages too many work so you know convergence into other sectors involving the hrd the livelihood sector and in engaging them in this work and making them you know ecd and nutrition sensitive is is an important take home message which i take from your uh, presentation thank you so much ashi so we'll move on to our next speaker and we have been emphasizing a lot on the cross sectoral approach and the importance of early childhood development but uh, my question is for professor nura purpat sir do you think it is still crucial to keep nutrition as a key focus of early years intervention while we create an enabling environment for the holistic development so do you think it is possible to convince the policy makers to invest in early childhood development while using art other uh, traditional methods of engaging with the community as an important component of jan aandolan uh, which is a part of the poshan abhiyan over to you professor kurpat uh, thank you thank you suparna and of course uh, uh, thank you to the organizers it's a fine panel to be a part of So Suparna just to start and let me give you a fun fact and I think most of you know this fun fact but let's see did you know that at 2 years a child achieves half its adult height roughly uh, it's not set in stone but in general in the first 2 years a child achieves half its adult height you tell a mother that <clears throat> and it immediately strikes a chord and she begins to think that's very important and you'll be surprised how many mothers do not know that the other problem is that once they have reached that percentile of height which seems to determine how much they will grow as adults they're pretty much stable after that and if you try to shift them by feeding them too much you actually run the risk of making them grow obese So when you ask me is it critical to keep nutrition as a key focus of the early years I'll tell you that in the first 2 years it is essential it is really critical it is for me an irritant to hear um, well we should now nutrition's not important maybe we should look at something else I don't believe that's true I think that you need a whole basket of approaches for these young children and nutrition is a critical part of it uh, you need bricks to build a house <clears throat> and i mean up to now we have maybe the pendulum has swung too much towards only nutrition and that is a hangover of reductionist science as you'll know and today when we look at surveys and we say oh look nutrition doesn't work i think that's a hangover of poor methods you'll probably think one of the biggest challenges of this century is to figure out what people eat we really don't know and we just we just believe we can do ask people questions for a day and figure out what they eat in a big survey and then do some kind of regressions analyses and then we figure out nutrition's not important i'll tell you this <clears throat> and these are learnings from clinical experience which are very important there is no doubt that children do very well when they are fed no doubt at all if they are undernourished they will catch up if you feed them and anyone who's brought up children will know that if they are fed well they are happy and that leads me to the second point that you said enabling environment now you can do all the enabling you want <clears throat> but a hungry child is a cranky child a deficient child is a cranky child and both cranky children do not explore their environment If you go and try and enable the environment of a cranky child you will be met with rejection and people don't get that an anemic child is a cranky child so we really need to keep that in mind that if you want your other things to grow if you want their capacity to increase if you want their brains to develop well be clear that they have to be receptive and that will only come if they are happy and part of happiness not all of happiness is food so i will tell you this that you really need to focus in the first two years on prevention because most children most children are born fairly normal here's the thing in the first two years in india and all over the world children falter 
dramatically in the first two years. At the end of the first two years or two and a half years, they have faltered and then they are stable in that faltering. Yet, if you look at a lot of the care that we put into children in Anganwadis and other places, it's all after that. We've lost the battle by then. The, the first two years was a critical part. So I really feel it's very important to prevent. And <clears throat> I think India really tries to do what it can in terms of feeding children. I mean, the ICDS program is, is a remarkable program in its, in, in its vision. It, it needs the right foods. The point is, you can't just give cereals to a child and expect that you're meeting all its nutrient needs. You're not. You need a certain moderate, balanced kind of food. And if any of you believe in evolution, and you, you think about the early hominids who evolved to become homo sapiens through the business of encephalization, it happened because of fat, because of the fat they ate and the fat they got from sucking on the marrow of long bones. <clears throat> That's another story. But all I'll tell you is this, that if you go into a lot of the villages of India and you evaluate the diets of children, you'll find that what they are deficient in is fats. And we keep talking about protein and other things. The fat intake in the villages, in poor households, is awfully low, particularly at this young age when fats are very important. So you need moderation, you need nutrition, but you need a lot more. All right. Anyone who says I've got a solution is a reductionist at heart. And that person is relying on RCTs, which are internally valid, but externally they are completely invalid. You can't take one RCT from one place and put it somewhere else. You have to think very hard about what you do with nutrition. Now I'll end because I can see that your time is, is, is not enough. Is, uh, you asked, uh, can you convince policymakers to invest? In art, of course, art is credible. There's no doubt about it. Art is locally contextual. The only problem for me is that when I want to see interesting art, I find that art is interesting when it deals with conflict. Most filmmakers will tell you that. And most, most people who do Harikatas will tell you that. The whole conflict between good and evil makes the Mahabharata a great story. But that's your problem, that you have to really deal with art and, and think about how you can make it interesting. Or you don't want boring art. Uh, maybe that doesn't exist, but let me just put that out there. So I'll stop there, Suparna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kurpan. What I gained from your uh, advice is that it is important to give enough energy and calorie and proteins and fats to make the child happy and learn from the ECD program. So it's mutual. So we and need to see the child. All nutrients. Don't don't focus on energy. All nutrients. Yes, yeah. it is a nutrient dense, calorie dense diet, and that will make him happy and learn better. Thank you so much, Dr. Kurpan. So we'll just move on to our next speaker, and let us now explore a little bit of uh, funders' perspective. And my question, next question, is for uh, Miss Rebecca Fairburns. Rebecca, do you think that funders have an appetite for projects like Early Years Initiative? A project that believes in using art and traditional forms of uh, traditional culturally acceptable methods for public engagement to address global crisis like child nutrition. Also, how can we create interest or space for research projects that use art as a validated research tool for co production of knowledge? Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Saparna, and thank you for inviting me to join this panel today. Um, I'm here today representing the UK's major funder of research and innovation from our India office here in Delhi. And while I can't match Professor Kurpad's fun fact, I think the short answer to your long question is a big yeah. So I know that we have an appetite for projects that focus on key challenges, that engage participants, that work across traditional disciplinary and methodological boundaries to find new ways to unlock our understanding of global challenges. But I think your question deserves a longer answer. And the conversation so far today have touched on the power of art for healing or for therapy, for communication, for public engagement, as, and as a research method. And I hope to touch on a number of those points. So first you've asked, 
the funders have an appetite for this sort of research. Well, UK Research and Innovation, the UK's major public sector research and innovation funder, we've been supporting, in one form or another, research and data collection relating to people, their biology, their health, their socioeconomic position, their environmental context, and how that impacts their life chances for over 100 years. This support covers all life course stages, from birth to old age, and echoing Dr Fernandez's first point, through our longitudinal studies, includes preconception data too. I think it's extremely difficult to collect, and we can't quite tell when we're going to be pregnant. Um, indeed, one of the most socially significant findings in social science research relates to early childhood development and comes from these studies. So research has proven that even small-scale interventions in early childhood can lead to a doubling of individuals' lifetime income when you control for the other factors um, they've experienced throughout that time. So we are interested in this, and we are interested in working internationally in this space. I think this um, touches on Professor Kirkpad's point about RCTs only being relevant to the um, specific area in which they're undertaken. Um, similarly, with studies um, within national context, if you really want to understand and gain real insight into different environmental and policy impacts over the life course, including early years, you need to be able to take an international perspective on that and really view the differences across different people's experiences. In relation to the second part of your question, we also have an appetite to support the use of arts and art methodology in research looking at human health, as well as communication and public engagement of research. So, for example, in the first point, we have funded research exploring the use of arts to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 in different communities, to better capture the voices of different communities involved in research. So it's not just about research being done to people, but being done with people. And in the creative and youth-led practices around promoting health. I think here it's worth just reflecting very briefly on Dr Moore's point about um, we are focusing more broadly um, around what's going on in the home and what's going on in the community, recognising that pregnancy and child rearing aren't women's issues, they're social issues, and we need to be engaging beyond women to make sure that society is properly adjusting and, and providing for what women need, where often, particularly young women, don't have the agency to gain the support, the nutrients, and um, the security that they need to survive well. So, one study I particularly wanted to highlight, which I think Professor Lackenpoff mentioned right at the beginning, is the systematic review into the use of theatre as an intervention to support mental well-being. Now, I think that's a particularly important, though quite small, study because it pulls out a number of themes that I think relate to what we need to do moving forward to make sure that arts are properly connected into the science of early years. So. The, this study pulled out that the importance of the paucity of critical debate on the impact of arts-based methods for health research, pointing to the need to, for further methodological and theoretical framework development for science of arts-based approaches, I think that's really, really important for us to think about. There isn't the discussion that we need to make sure that arts-based disciplinary or theoretical or methodological approaches are properly picked up by the other hard or non-soft disciplines. Secondly, the study picked out that issues around small-scale studies undertaken so far, so studies that we've seen and supported in this way using arts-based methods in theory, are often too small and don't take enough of a longitudinal approach so that we, as funders or policymakers, and really establish long-term outcomes of arts-based interventions and the importance of those. I think the final point this study illuminated was that there are limited examples of collaborations between researchers and practitioners from diverse backgrounds. So most often research in this area is undertaken by teams that lack either cross-disciplinary skills in the academic sense or indeed that integration approach that Ms. Kathuria pointed out in her introductory points. It's the integration of disciplinary approaches and of expertise and systems, academic and community support that really are needed here. So we as funders know that there is a need for more work on methods, theoretical frameworks, 
and also for more interdisciplinary approaches at scale um, to support the research and move this forward. So yeah, we do have an appetite. But finally, and I think the critical part of your question really is, how can we make this happen? Um, how can we create interest in space? How can we find funding for this? That's the billion dollar question. And there are a number of steps I think we could be taking to achieve this. These include making sure we are building networks to address questions around the methodological and theoretical development that are needed. I'm absolutely not in a position amongst this esteemed panel to comment on the validity of the criticism that was unpicked in the study. But because the criticism exists, and as we are talking about pushing the boundaries of traditional approaches to this area of science, it needs to be fully addressed so that academics and decision-making panels have really easy access to counterpoints to this criticism so we can move beyond that more conservative approach to understanding the, the methods needed. And I think we need to be looking at ensuring participants and communities are part of research plans from the outset, that they're equal parts of decision-making processes. The research that really impacts people's lives, whether that's early years or another group, does need to fully engage with people and or practitioners that are working with these people in these key groups. So academic insight is critical, but again, as Dr. Moore outlined, so is the real practical understanding of the context in which interventions take place. And again, I think that um, echoes Ms. Katamuria's um, points earlier. So there is, of course, a role for funders here. The creation of UKRI was driven by the need to move the UK funding system to a position where we could capitalise on the strengths of disciplines and move beyond them. We work together behind the scenes in UKRI. We are nine disciplinary funders. And we work quietly to make sure that all responsive mode applications into us, where it's bottom up in the community, um, are treated fairly, regardless of which part they come into and which disciplines they represent, so that we can make sure peer review comes from the right elements across the whole breadth of the topics of, and methods covered in the application. I mean, that's not easy, and I'm sure we don't always get it 100% right, but we do work really hard to do this, and I think that's really critical. UKRI also strong has a very strong public engagement agenda and i think this picks up on the point of art as public engagement um, as an organization our vision is for an outstanding research and innovation system in the uk which everyone has the opportunity to contribute and from which everyone can benefit so our public engagement work is fundamental to achieving this overall goal and we want to work across diverse areas to make that happen and we want to work with international partners to make that happen. We can learn so much from what different communities have done and their experience of their communities and their movement where they've reached now. But I think it's really important to recognise that there's also a need and a role for our academic community here. We need you to build the networks and the communities to push this forward. We need you to hold events like this. We need you to build the engagement with policymakers and with funders and with normal people so that we've got the momentum and the critical mass going so that we can hear you. And I think it's only by working together as academics, as the public and as funders that we'll really be able to make progress in this way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was really enlightening. The key take home point here is, base take home message here is basically we have to work together the funders need to be connected to the grassroots and the policymakers and funders have to be influenced by the academicians to meet the uh, to to reach our objectives thank you so much rebecca um, now we cannot really conclude this discussion without a dialogue on early childhood development during the current covid-19 era and for this i am uh, asking this question to professor vijay raghavan sir we are seeing serious implications of containment measures on child education, health and nutrition, and most importantly, the cognitive development. Do you think an integrated approach that we are discussing here can open new horizons and avenues for addressing the problem during the COVID-19 era? Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Suparna. And it's um, a great honor to be here. And particularly to listen to everyone. It's been an uh, invaluable learning experience uh, as expected from this uh, group of people. Uh, let me just, I'll be very brief about COVID and 
early child development. Uh, there is no question, given the importance we have just heard about early periods, right up to the second year at least, uh, from conception onwards, that a pandemic will wreak disaster on early child development. And the challenge is not uh, about appreciating that, but about what needs to be done or what can be done. We've gone through a period which, you know, was extreme, and it's clear now going into the second year that we are now at the end of the beginning, and we will now have to deal with this pandemic going on onwards through the second year and later on. This is going to cause huge uh, impact on the very old and on the very young, particularly more on the very young, because they're going to be around for a long time. Uh, we've heard about the reason, I mean, the value of a you know, comprehensive development, which requires communities, nutrition, play, schooling, everything coming together. All that, you know, has gone for a toss. So we must come into innovative ways in each community, whether rich or poor, small or big, on how to deal with this. And I think there, there are some valuable roles uh, science and technology can play. It's not a solution, but it can allow in some ways effective proximity uh, from a human social point of view while maintaining effective distance from a disease point of view. Uh, children are going to be the uh, ways of communicating the uh, virus, but they also need to work and play together. Uh, they need to play with their parents and their grandparents and so on. How can we manage both? That is, that is the challenge we have, and I think we must address that. If I may, Suparna, um, I don't know whether I have time. I'd like to very briefly address, in this context, uh, many of the uh, issues which our colleagues uh, have raised. And could I have a couple of minutes for that? Uh, or are we running out of time? No, we can, we can give you two minutes. Uh, thanks for your patience. We have the time. Yeah, it's more of distilling different viewpoints. You know, I think what we're talking about to um, sum up very um, pithily is the intersection of biology on one side and culture and society on the other. We have a huge amount of learnings which have come up, come upon, both by looking at uh, from medical practices uh, and, you know, how uh, that impacts on our lives, but also on what uh, my friend Arura pointed out uh, as reductionist scientific approaches. Now, we have, you know, at both ends, I think, deep problems. Um, at the end of looking at societies, cultures, and everyone coming together, and we try to infer what to do on a specific issue, such as nutrition and child development, uh, we are bound to go wrong. You know, our expectation that somehow the analysis of big data can tell us what one needs to do at an individual level in a particular community is, you know, hubris. But the other kind of hubris that somehow when I know the mechanisms of nutrient uptake and physiological impact at the molecular level and how that impacts on brain development, that somehow I have the answer to everything is also complete nonsense. So how does one deal with both these situations and come out of it has always been a challenge in medicine. Um, public health requires us to form policies which impact everyone. And we all know that those policies uh, are meaningful at a public health level and very often not cater to the individual. And anything which caters to the individual is unaffordable and unimplementable in a public health perspective. Today, I would submit that there is a potential for us using communities, small communities, groups of people, as the level of abstraction, because they're more or less similar, to collect data about what is happening in a comprehensive manner, education, family, economy, uh, play, health, and so on, and use that information, distill it, to compare it with similar locations all over 
the country or the world and feedback at a quasi personalized level on what can be done uh, as a realm of possibility to that community. We do that already in completely unconnected matters very efficiently. Uh, today, even people who are economically in a very difficult situation use you know, search engines such as Google uh, and so on to decide where to eat or where to go and so on. So the adoptability of such approaches is certainly there. Uh, so that's not, uh, but that needs to now be scaled and made amenable. And there the interface of government and community organizations as the honest broker to enable communities to adopt these kinds of technologies are important. There, art, I would broaden the definition of art. It's not art, it's not a painting, it's not a mural, it's not a YouTube clip. But I would put art as, you know, your local cultural uh, milieu in the totality. That cultural mooring of all we do needs to be there. And that needs to be imbibed. And the only way I think we can change social practices is within similar communities or within similar components within a community. You see your neighbor, your cousin, your sibling doing something which really is makes for a happier child and a healthier child. That allows you to change and their cultural practices and culture can be important. My seeing on television a child in Sweden growing up well because she's nursed well doesn't necessarily make me change. Uh, and conversely, someone from Sweden or Mumbai telling me what is good for my child doesn't necessarily make me change. So these are very complex issues. There's no simple answer. But I think we must choose the right level of abstraction to come to an answer. And that is, in my view, is a small community and using data analysis to have a bottom up imbibing of the value of that data. In communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Vijay Raghavan, for your insightful thoughts. And it's really important to realize the importance of the cultural milieu, as you said, and the, the positive deviance approach, which we often use in our nutrition work. Uh, where we learn from our community, the good practices. Okay, so uh, we are running short of time, but with uh, permission from Vishy, can I take two questions from the audience? Because yes, the question please go ahead. Already... Thank you so please much. Go ahead. So the first question is from uh, uh, how much digital is India and how the reach is like when we talk about research and social issues? So. Um, uh, Professor uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan, would you like to answer this question? The reach of digital India, because we are all talking about digital India now. Thank you. You know, uh, the problem uh, in a digital only approach is that it assumes that the um, analysis of information and its reach to people will allow them to use this information to make decisions in their lives. I went to a relatively well-to-do college in Delhi University where everyone had a smartphone and they were studying there using this $1 paper microscope, the fold scope, looking at you know life forms in the pond which they got nearby. Now to understand what was happening in what they saw under the microscope, they were referring to a 1954 zoology textbook and they wanted more photocopies of that as their only single arts. But they were sitting with the smartphone where using that and connected to, to all over the world, they could do anything. So the digital availability is not the issue. It's what, you know, um, Chandrasekharan, the um, chairman of Tata Sons calls the bridgetal, bridging the digital to the real life. And there you need the teacher, the broker, who says, look, here's something I see under the microscope, or here's my community issue, and this is how I can go to the net and work and get this done. And that constant role of a real mentor, a person over there, for anything we do is important. Otherwise, the digital tools will not be used. Thank you. Uh, just one more question, and uh, I think we have to close this session. Um, and this question is, can ECD uh, uh, be embedded, get embedded into the activities of the flagship programs of the country, like the National Health Mission. So the wellness centers, health and wellness centers, do you think it is feasible to do that 
Dr. Moore, would you like to comment on this? My sense, ma'am, is that actually India has one of the largest ECD programs in the world, which is the ICDS. Uh, it is a mainstream program. It's actually a well-funded program, relatively speaking. In fact, we in the health world somewhat envy the adequacy or the relative adequacy of funding that the nutrition world gets. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure that the challenge is that it's not embedded well or that it's not. Um, I think the challenge is how do I convert all of that machinery and the million Anganwadi workers that I have, which unlike Asha's, are at least contractual uh, and actually get paid somewhat uh, into something that transfers and translates into the kind of vision that Dr. Kurpa, Dr. Fernandez, and uh, Madam Kathuria, you know, uh, want. I think that's really our challenge, you know, and, and I think we have not gotten to it. Uh, as I said in my remarks, I'm disheartened by the Kerala uh, regression because if they can't do it, you know, I wonder who can. Uh, and I think one needs to look more deeply and not the quick fix, but, you know, maybe as Dr. Vijaragwan said, you know, go deeper into the community and understand what, what, what is going on here? What, why is it that all of our good intentions and good money and resources and good people, um, you know, and it's a struggle. I mean, I remember I was a, you know, conversation that Bill had with our prime minister, Bill Gates, when I was in the Gates Foundation. And Gujarat has done remarkable work in terms of effort, you know, from what I could tell. But the result, again, you know, something secret sauce is somehow uh, escaping us. Uh, and I think that may need a deeper conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Moore. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot take more questions. We have questions coming up. So kindly, if you wish to uh, interact with our panelists. We are happy to share your questions with the panelists through email and we'll get back to you if you drop your emails as well. So thank you so much panelists and I'm glad to wrap up this session on a positive note on the recognition of holistic intervention in early years among program implementers, funders, academicians, policy makers and we as uh, researchers. We also have one clear vision. I give an analogy here that like supplementary feeding in nutrition intervention should supplement and not substitute the usual diet of a child to thrive. Similarly, nutrition interventions need to be supplemented and complemented and not substituted with other sectoral interventions to have a real impact during the early years. I thank all our panelists for sharing their thoughts and valuable time for this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and thank you, Superna, for hosting uh, a very wonderful panel. Uh, thank you very much. Now that we've had an insightful discussion, we hope these are some small steps to influence policies related to mothers and child's holistic welfare. Uh, during this event, we've also discussed the need for limiting adverse childhood experiences, and one such detrimental experience is the exposure to domestic violence. So coming up next, we have Dr. Karthik Sharma, filmmaker and founder of Pahus and the co-lead of the Early Years exhibition and Alex Flosherts, founder of Zero to Expo UK, artist and curator of the Early Years exhibition, who will now share with you a short film screening of Unsafe Spaces. Over to you, uh, Karthik and Alex. 25th March, 2020. India goes under lockdown. Since then, Ragini and her colleagues get on a conference call every day. But unlike them, she always keeps her video off, so her colleagues don't see the bruises on her face. Shivani posts popular cooking videos for the appreciative comments, a welcome change from the usual crude abuses she's always subjected to. Akash has been constantly in touch with his friends, but he messages, never calls. Worried that his friends will overhear his father's loud ringing voice and his mother's helpless shrieks. Sabina spends hours in the empty park next to her house walking alone, only because her violent father is working from home. Malati still goes to work, although her employer wants to give her paid leave. 
She would rather risk her life to an unknown disease than be stuck in a room with her alcoholic husband. These are difficult times, and even more so for those with violent homes. While you quarantine and self-isolate, don't turn a blind eye to violence happening around you. If you hear or witness any form of domestic abuse, call these numbers and inform the authorities. Stay home, stay safe. Just don't stay silent. Very inspiring film um, screening of unsafe spaces, um, which um, really talks about domestic violence. But we have to remember that one in three women worldwide experiences domestic violence at some point in their lives, with pregnancy being um, a known trigger or existing abuse, which may worsen during pregnancy or after birth. The domestic abuse during pregnancy puts a woman and her unborn child in danger. It can have an effect on fetal and infant brain development, increases the risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, infection, premature birth and injury or death to the baby. Domestic violence can lead to depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health problems both during and after pregnancy. This makes it really difficult for mothers to care for their children. However, in India, a third of boys and girls aged 15 to 19 consider it justified for a husband to raise his hand at his wife. So, yeah, so we've tried to relate this um, film screening to the, the 1000 days and, um, and it, it offers some, some, you know, some telephone numbers that you can call if you need more support or if you know somebody who um, needs further support. So thank you. Back to you, Kartik. So I'll quickly introduce the filmmakers uh, for the short animation film. And we're very grateful to the, uh, the film was written by Shreya Sarkar and Priyadarshi Kastigar. It was voiced by Bedatri Datta Chaudhary, animated by Priyadarshi Kastigar and produced by Our Little India. I would take, like to take a minute just to share a quick message from the filmmakers. Uh, the first few weeks of the pandemic were, in a lot of ways, a time to look at our privileges, like a home, which is supposed to be our safe space. However, we can't imagine how difficult a time it has been in homes with a history of domestic violence. This film is a small effort to raise awareness around this issue and hopefully initiate some meaningful actions. If I may again thank the filmmakers for being so generous with their creative, creative outputs, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. The link for the film will also be shared at the Pahu space, so you can watch it, watch it at your convenience. Over to you, Vishi. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Alex. That was a thought-provoking video. Stay safe, but not, not silent. Quite a powerful message there. To conclude this, uh, powerful event, I would like to call upon Dr. Vasan Sambandamurthy, CEO of DPT Welcome Trust India Alliance, to share his thoughts. Uh, over to you, Vasan. Thank you, Vishy. In our endeavor to support a research ecosystem that facilitates the advancement of science and innovation to improve health and well-being, India Alliance seeks the right partnership to establish thematic grounds to enable framing of well-rounded policies for the betterment of society. For more than 10 years of enabling high quality, internationally competent biomedical research in India, we at India Alliance through public engagement forums aim to create awareness, generate evidence, and deliver innovative solutions to improve public health. India Alliance came together with UCL, University College of London, via uh, Dr. Monica Lacan Paul, to deliver a global virtual exhibition that touched upon key aspects for both mother and child's health during the first thousand days, uh, aptly themed the early years of window of opportunity. It is through such global partnerships that India Alliance creates a platform to bring in private and public experts to discover, prioritize, and create holistic solutions that benefit the society at large. I would like to take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the members 
who brought this event together and took us onwards to another dimension by blending arts and science together. It was a terrific session. Thank you all. Keeping in mind the key messages that our eminent panelists brought out today, we will continue to engage with a diverse set of stakeholders to bring about an integrated and impactful change for the welfare of mother and the young child in the first thousand days of a child's life. Last but not the least, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our audience today who have made this time to be a part of this exceptional launch event. We hope that you enjoyed the event as much as we have enjoyed bringing it to you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ish. Thank you, Dr. Vasan. So working together, it is the way forward. So uh, now I request uh, Professor Monica to have the last word. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Vishy. Everybody knows I like to have the last word, so thank you very much. And I was honoured, really, to be here with so many eminent people. That's all I can say. Um, it has been a interesting, thought-provoking, emotional journey, really, to hear what we have over the past two hours or more. Um, hearing from the community about what really, really matters to them, what the experiences are from the community, and learning from the community and taking action according to what the community needs. This has come through quite clearly through the whole two hours. We can do lots of RCTs, we can do lots of data analysis, but actually if it doesn't change the person who lives within their own cultural context, nothing is going to happen. Individuals learn from each other, their peers, their neighbours, their relations, and that's what, the, what we need to be doing, getting to the heart of the people. And what better way to get to the heart of the people is the arts. However, the arts are also challenging, as we've heard already um, from um, Raghu Rai. I mean, you know, just doing an exhibition isn't going to change the world. Putting a beautiful picture up isn't going to change the world. So what we want to do and what we need to do is bring us all together through different media, different dialogues, keep the conversation going, keep the action going and try and bring about change for the children who deserve it in our society. So just on that note, a few final things. You know, it's, it's, we heard about a hungry child cannot learn, learn. We must feed the child to be able to make them engage with the learnings and the community in the world that they live in. We need building blocks for them to, to build their house with so that they can move into the future. There's a lot of noise around us. How do we distill that noise to make impact and action? And how do we engage with local rituals through art, folklore, um, songs, everything else that we know about to actually bring about change? But really, we've all been here talking together. Let's keep the dialogue together. And I want to finally say a big thank you to India Alliance and UCL, all the people behind the scenes, all our guests and also our moderators. who have really given up so much of their time to bring us all together today. And hopefully we can continue this dialogue over the years to come and really do something amazing for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks to all the participants and the guests who've taken the time to be with us. We look forward to hosting you again in the future during a physical exhibition that is scheduled to take place in November of 2021 in New Delhi, COVID permitting. Hopefully it does. So more details will be shared in time. To visit the virtual gallery after the event, please visit www.pahus.org early years us. So a very big thank you to all of you. If all the team members behind the scenes can switch on their cameras, we can have a round of applause. Thanks to all the participants. Thanks to all the people who have contributed to this event. Thanks to all the team members who work behind the scenes to make this event a success. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, everyone. Stay Thank safe. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Take care. We'll stay in touch. Thank you very much.